this tribal thing is so incredible. How many of you can relate to tribal things? You know, I mean, we talk about the tribes, the tribes. Pick me, pick me, that's us, right? I mean, aren't we part of that? You know, it goes back to the body of Christ. Many members, one body. He didn't make one tribe. He made 12, 13 tribes. How about the tribe of Dina? That's a tribe. She's got the tribe all to herself, right? She's got, you go, you go, boys. I'm good. The tribe of Dina. Nobody ever talks about that. Why can't that be a tribe? So she started her own tribe, didn't she? So how many of you would agree, beyond a shadow of a doubt, in the spirit, we are living in exciting times. Amen? So you're either, you're either in two camps, the right camp or the wrong camp, right? You're either, you're either thinking the glass is half full or it's half empty. My cup is spilling over, so you can pick whatever you want. So incredible things are happening, and, uh, and I'll be sharing some stuff later, but I want to look at the prophetic significance of Hanukkah. Now, hear me out on this. All of this is no good if your heart doesn't line up with the revelation. So I want to encourage you, as we read the Bible, the things that God loves, we begin to love. Amen? Because we have our own loves, our own desires. Amen? I've got my little concoction of large curd cottage cheese from Publix with olives that have blue cheese inside of them. I cut those olives in half, mind you, and I display them around the cottage cheese. I sprinkle a little bit of dill on that cottage cheese. That's large curd with olives cut in half to have blue cheese. Also with my Celtic sea salt. I grind a little bit of Celtic sea salt on top of the large curd cottage cheese with the blue cheese olives cut in half with the dill. And then, of course, you know, I finish it off with a little pepper, okay? So that's kind of detailed, isn't it? But I really enjoy it, and I put it together. It's my little concoction. Nobody else likes it, so it's perfect for me. <laughs> Nobody steals it. Nobody wants it. But I'm telling you, since, since I, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not against social media. I'm not against music or TV or movies, but I, I want to say something to you. Since I've really pulled away from all of that stuff, I feel closer to God. Not that I don't use it. You know, I, my wife's got a, a Facebook account, and I, I put some inspirational stuff on there. I'll put something on there to make you think or to encourage you, but I'm not putting something on there to argue with you or fight with you, but I'll state a fact or whatever to encourage you. But, but these are the times we're living in, everybody, and we don't have any time to waste. You know, we don't have any time to waste. So let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let's find it exactly prophetically where we are, Amen. It's like when we went to the Wiregrass Mall, you know, I had to get a map. I'm not just going to walk around. And that's what we do in the spirit. We just walk around. And we think we're in the tabernacle. But we're not in the tabernacle. We've wandered off. So the Father wants to speak to us through his word and through his seasons. So if we're reading the Torah portions and the half Torah portions, we're all on the same page. This is the only way he can communicate with us through his spirit. Amen. Because right now, there's a lot of goofiness going on in the world and in the churches. There's a lot of goofiness and false prophets. We're going to talk more about the Olivet Discourse and all these other things that are happening. And I'm, I'm getting some major revelation about the things that are happening on this earth and how we can avoid them and how we can be healthy and be overcomers, how we can truly have the victory. So looking at the prophetic significance of Hanukkah, this is a teaching I would do anywhere in the world. Everyone should know this. Everybody. If I was at Ruth Eckert Hall or University of South Florida, if, if I went to Bell Shoals Baptist Church, amen, this teaching has to be taught to everyone, saved, unsaved, a heathen, uh, a Muslim, it doesn't matter because God's word is true. He gives us prophecies to prove that he's God because only he can fulfill them. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Why would he tell things in advance? To prove that he's God. But some people don't like that proof. So this isn't even, you know, this isn't even evangelism in and of itself. I mean, if you were to say to people, oh, listen, Hanukkah is going to happen again, Papa, have a conversation. Wow, you didn't mention the church, didn't even mention Jesus, but this is an interesting subject. And, you know, it's really not even being taught for the most part. I mean, there's some traditions that are taught and different things and the basic story and Antiochus, but really th this is something that, that I've discovered that's not really discussed 
And these are the kind of conversations we should all be having to glean and to, and to grow. So let's begin this journey of the prophetic significance Hanukkah. It's, it's really, really an, an incredible story. Uh, and by the way, Hanukkah actually begins next Tuesday night, so it's coming fast and furious. Let's look at prophecy is the foretelling of history in advance. History is prophecy that has been fulfilled. And I won't get into the address or where it's at, but Peter mentions that prophecy is of no private interpretation. Amen? So, so prophecy is of no private interpretation. God has a fulfillment for that prophecy. Sometimes this is near fulfillment, far fulfillment, but it will be fulfilled. Let me understand what I'm saying. So in hindsight, it's easy to go into the book of Daniel and begin to take it apart and look at it historically and how it, it came to pass. Especially Daniel chapter 11 is very, 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 very interesting. Uh, even to the point of the uh, four generals of Alexander the Great, the whole historical significance of that time period is even detailed. So basically we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's visions. We have Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's vision. Remember, he had these visions Daniel did. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. So we have the Babylonian Empire in this dream, do we not? This empire has come and gone. What about the Persians? The Persians have come and gone, another empire, empire number two. There's four main empires. That's actually found in Zechariah as well. And, and of course, the Grecian Empire is the third one with Alexander the Great. And after Alexander the Great's death, around 323 B.C., his kingdom was divided up into four territories, four generals, amen? Uh, his, his bosom buddies, his, his, his school friends, his chums, was divided up. All of his heirs were killed. After this, we have the Roman Republic from 509 B.C. to 27 B.C. Once again, there was a Roman Republic, amen? This is why America is really not a democracy. We are a republic. So people that are in office in our government actually represent the people of the United States of America. I know that's hard to believe. You don't believe it, but it is so true. If you want to know why our government is rotten and there's all these scandals, it's because the people of America are rotten. Now, you can say what you want, but we put these people in office, okay? I believe in voting. I'm a political pastor, right? And you get these candidates that won't even tell you what they believe. How could you even vote for them if they're supposed to represent you? This is how deluded it is. The politics and the governments, amen? You're supposed to pray for your leaders and all these other things. I'm not into anarchy and all this other stuff, but we got to call a spade a spade. we got to call it out. If a leader says something wrong, does something wrong, we can call him out, but we still pray for him, amen? You don't have an excuse to be a leader and get away with stuff. You can't just say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. I've realized this as a pastor. I don't have the right to say whatever I want and do whatever I want without repercussions. If something's inappropriate, it's inappropriate. We need to call it out. And that's what we're dealing with today. And I'm only sharing this because it's important for you to understand that uh, they are saying that in the book of Daniel, it's like the skeleton of prophecy. Some of you are intimidated by prophecy, or maybe you just twisted prophecies or had prophecies taught to you in, in a wrong fashion. But, but Daniel, the book of Daniel, is the skeleton of prophecy. It's the basics of Prophecy 101. You have to study Daniel. Okay, and you break it down, and then the meat that goes on the skeleton would be considered like the prophets, okay? So this is the lowdown that's happening uh, as we begin to, to move forward in that. So just keep, keep that in mind. And once again, the first Roman emperor was Augustus, and uh, he began to rule in like 27 B.C. to 1480. So the first emperor was right there around uh, that time period. So the Hanukkah story that took place nearly 200 years before Yeshua's birth is going to take place in the near future. I made that a point, the near future. That's my speculation. That's my choice. I really believe that we will be the generation that will see the return of Messiah. Okay? I don't have a date, but I really believe in my spirit from looking at the evidence, weighing it out. I believe we are that generation. We won't get into all that, but that's, that's my thought. And so uh, we need to look busy because he's coming. Now, Antiochus IV Epiphanes came against the Israelites and the Mosaic Covenant, 175 to 163 B.C., okay? So there's a, there's a fighting going on among the four empires, especially among uh, the, the Ptolemy uh, dynasty and the uh, uh, Seleucids dynasty. 
in the, or the Seleucid dynasty. Those two fought for many, many, many years, amen. And, of course, Antiochus, he comes from the Seleucid or Seleucid dynasty. He comes from the Syrian dynasty. Syria is not in the news, are they? You don't think there's a stronghold over Syria today, do you? Absolutely. They've been in civil war since, what, 2011, I believe. But anyway, um, this is all going to make sense. So once again, what we're seeing is, is this particular character, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He actually believed that he was deity. Okay? This is where you get the word epiphanies, God in the flesh, that he was a God. Now, we're not experiencing that in our culture, are we? Little gods running around, perhaps? You know, forget about Christmas trees. Everybody's eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're in every home. Everyone knows what's right. Everyone knows what's wrong, you know. And the famous expression is, you know you've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when you say, you know what I think. Then you just walk away. Now, the theme of of Hanukkah uh, has a lot of repercussions. One of the themes is civil war, okay, civil war. Traditionally, as expressed in the first and second book of Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt was painted as a national resistance to a foreign political and cultural oppression. In modern times, however, scholars have argued that the king was instead intervening in a civil war between the traditional Jews in the country and the Hellenized Jews in Jerusalem. According to Joseph P. Schultz, modern scholarship, on the other hand, considers the Maccabean revolt less as an uprising against foreign oppression than as a civil war between the Orthodox and Reformist parties in the Jewish camp, okay? So we have to avoid civil war, okay? Civil war. We can see it playing out in our families today. Certain siblings siding with certain siblings. We see sibling rivalry. We see civil war. We even see it in a marriage, the man against the woman, the woman against the man, the wife against the husband, husband against the wife. There's this civil war, amen? We can see it happening in the Messianic movement, in the Hebrews of the Christian faith movement. There's a civil war war, okay? People are siding with this side or that side. I'm on Yahweh's side, okay? I've been blessed not to have to play church politics. Yahweh has always had this congregation. This congregation belongs to Yahweh. I'm just the facilitator. I just make sure the ship is going in the right direction. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Because there's things that we have to fix in this movement. There's steps that we have to take in order to bring back the Messiah, And a lot of it has to do with humility, a lot of humility, amen? We simply have to do what the Father has asked us to do, no more, no less. So we can see, of course, civil war being played out in our culture, can we not? Isn't the most terrible feeling to see where all these people just don't get along? In the NFL, you know, whether you're kneeling or standing or whatever you're doing, right? In sports, there's civil war. In the music industry, there's civil war, right? It's Katy Perry versus Taylor Swift, you know. I mean, think about it, people. This is real stuff. Now, you say, what's he mentioning that for? Because it's in the culture. It's in the culture. Now, Hollywood is turning on each other. There's civil war. Now, there's civil war among the Democrats because of the sexual harassment charges and things now. You need to step down. You need to do this. You know, you you hear what I'm saying? It's, it's civil war, folks, because the enemy comes to divide and conquer. He comes to subtract. He comes to divide, kill, steal, and destroy. Remember, there, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual laws, there is no redemption for demons. There's no redemption for fallen angels. They cannot be redeemed. They will not be redeemed. Only the homo sapien made in God's image can be redeemed. So they have nothing to lose by throwing everything they can at you. I know this. They're doing it out of spite. Why would Muslims kill Muslims? Out of spite. Amen? It doesn't make sense. Out of spite. So Antiochus prohibited the following things. How relevant is this teaching, everybody? If we didn't have our Hebrew roots, it wouldn't mean anything. Nothing would even make sense to look back at this and reflect on this if we didn't discover our Hebrew roots. Amen? He prohibited unclean sacrifices on the altar. I know, that's right. He 
he prohibited clean sacrifices on the altar. See, someone's paying attention over there. See what I'm saying? He prohibited honoring the Sabbath. All of you are guilty in this building right now. You're guilty. Keeping of the feasts, circumcising of all the males, and the Torah. He prohibited all these things. Why? When people give you a hard time because you do all of these things and practice all of these things, which we do, it's one of two things. It's ignorance or it's another spirit. Why would Antiochus come up with this? Because he's a puppet of Satan. He's influenced by Hasatan. He enters people's hearts to do his bidding. You can read about this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 41 through 50. See, being raised Catholic in my Catholic background and Catholicism has paid off. The Apocrypha. You know, as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible, you can use any resource you have. How many of you understand what I'm saying? There's goofy books out there and different things and stuff, but what I'm saying is that if it, if it coincides and it's historical and, and you can figure it out and it matches, it makes sense to use the source. You eat the fish, spit out the bones. Going back to the Civil War, you know, right now religious Jews versus secular Jews can create a civil war in the country of Israel. Amen? Even among Judaism, there's different factions, okay? So just looking at some percentages here, just to give you an idea of what's going on, the, the secular Jews in Israel make up 41.4%. Traditional would be 38.5%. Orthodox is 19.9%. So theoretically, the secular and traditional is greater than the orthodox. How many understand what I'm saying? It's more secular than religious. Would you all agree? Is that America? Absolutely. Secular means what? Without church, without a religious connotation. But look what Antiochus encouraged. He encouraged the following. He encouraged idolatry, sacrificing of unclean animals, and assimilation. It's like that bumper sticker, coexist. Why don't you just put tolerance? Coexist. Listen, God hasn't called you out to call everybody else out. He's called you out for him. And we think, well, God's revealed all this to me. I need to jump up on the soapbox and tell everybody that needs to do this. It's wrong. First of all, you're violating somebody's free will. Second of all, not everybody wants to express their faith the way that we do at Beit Tehillah. See, we're all in agreement that I'll hold hands, I'll do a mayim. This is how we express our faith. We dance. We have congregational dance. This is how we express our faith. Amen. Some people don't believe in dancing. I'm not mentioning any names. We believe in the public reading of scriptures from Genesis to maps. Amen. We believe all of the Bible. We want more than just three verses and a fish story. This is how we practice our faith. People would say, your services are too long. This is how we practice our faith. Listen, the longer I stay here, the less I sin, the less money I spend. I want to stay here all day. Because as soon as I leave, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to spend money. So why not just stay here? Save money. Don't get in trouble. Sounds like a good deal. Some of you can't relate because maybe you're single. But even you can get in trouble. So this is what's happening. Antiochus does wickedly against the covenant. Daniel 11.32. Daniel 11.32. Let's read this. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Wow. I was just copying a few little notes here based upon this particular verse. I thought it was interesting. Look at what he's going to do here. This is Antiochus Epiphanes against the covenant. How many of you know that Torah is not popular with a lot of people in our culture today? Right? The law has been done away with. We don't have to do this anymore. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Look at what, look at what this spirit does. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Corrupt means to pervert. See, the Torah has been perverted, disregarded, 
Amen? The American Standard Version, the word corrupt is pervert. He perverts by flatteries. I love the amplified version of this particular verse, Daniel 11, 30. This is the amplified version. I'm going to turn it up in stereo. Check this out. With smooth words of flattery and praise, he will turn to godlessness those who are willing to disregard the Mosaic Covenant. But the people who are spiritually mature and know their God will display strength and take action to resist. I resist you. I mean, think about it, folks. You can't cave into that. You got to rise up and say, what's up, man? Toys, good foot of that, man. Back off, man. I resist you. I'm serious. Seriously, you got to get jacked up. You got to do something, man. Because this is what we need to do. Because they said they would do it. They're called the Maccabees, right? The Maccabees? They're still alive and well. They're singing now. In the English Standard Version, ESV, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Amen. We don't know the Torah. We do the Torah. We read in the Bible and then we do it. This word corrupt means to cause to dissemble. The word corrupt here means to dissemble. Torah puts your life together. Not having Torah breaks your world apart. That's why we live in a fallen world with a fallen nature because they don't have Torah. Because Torah tells us what sin is. You don't decide what sin is. He's already decided for us. Being anti-Torah. I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the Torah, none of this would even matter right now. I wouldn't even have a message for you. And there's a Torah scroll behind us. And I want to thank Angela Fitch. Angela, God bless you. Thank you so much that I have Rabbi Eliezer E. Adams' business card, Torah scribe from the Bible Museum. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Woo. Saving that for later. He's a rock star. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, boy. I get butterflies in my stomach. Now, let's look at these resources. Let's look at something here so, so we can be aware of what's going on. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to make up your mind what you believe, and what you don't believe. Because faith without works is dead. So let's, let's look at 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 41 through 43. Let's read the Apocrypha. Never thought you'd do this, but it's okay. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, each abandoning his particular customs. All the Gentiles conformed to the command of the king, and many Israelites were in favor of his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. Wow. Isn't that the culture we live in, everybody? If it feels good, do it. There's no more reasoning, no moral absolutes, right? It's just, it's all relevant. It's not. Got to have moral absolutes. So Antiochus desecrated the temple. Look at 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. Let's read this. He insolently invaded the sanctuary and took away the golden altar, the lampstand for the light with all its fixtures, the offering table, the cups and the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the crowns, and the golden ornament on the facade of the temple. It seems like even the kitchen sink. Keep reading. He stripped off everything and took away the gold and silver and all the precious vessels. He also took the hidden treasures he could find. Taking all this, he went back to his own country after he had spoken with great arrogance and shed much blood. Wow. 
He spoke with great arrogance and shed much blood. Are we seeing that today? We, we truly are. We're seeing a lot of arrogance and the shedding of blood. It's interesting if you go back and study the image in Daniel. When you get to the Roman Empire, it's two legs, right? The Eastern Empire, the Western Empire of Rome. But you get moving down these legs, and this is the longest empire was the Roman Empire. And we talk about the revived Roman Empire in the future, and we'll talk more about that. But the bottom line is that as the iron goes into what? The feet, partly of what? Iron and clay. So prophetically, we're actually in the heels of this image. Because, you know, iron and clay don't mix. Amen? Iron and clay don't mix. And so as we see this image, we just have to be on the lookout for, for 10 leaders or 10 regions and keep your, keep your, keep your eyes open for this. Because we will never know who the Antichrist is until he usurps three of those 10. It's just prophecy 101, people. People want to say this person is the Antichrist and that person is the Antichrist and my wife's the Antichrist and my husband's the Antichrist. No. I've heard this from people. I mean, no, no, no. You'll never know until there's 10, he usurps three of them. See, we got to be strong in the days ahead, everybody, because there's a lot of deception going on right now, a lot of deception. Let's continue on, because now we're going to look at the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11.31. This is still Antiochus. Let's read it together. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Would you all agree that Jerusalem is holy? The Temple Mount is holy. Two temples were on the Temple Mount. Would you agree? It's a holy place, isn't it? Isn't that where his name is? It's never changed, has it? Did you know that, that, that Shiloh was where the, the tabernacle was for over, what, almost 400 years? And then they, of course, used Hebron for a little bit. Then ultimately, they ended up in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital. To this day, it's still the capital. This particular word, abomination, means disgusting, filthy, detestable thing. So it's got to be obvious. It's not the Dome of the Rock. Some people would say the Dome of the Rock is the abomination of desolation. I'm going to guarantee you it is not. It means disgusting, filthy, or detestable thing. So if it's where the temple was, it's a holy place, then how many of you know that uh, anything other than that up there would be detestable? Why would they do that? Because Hasatan wants to usurp the Godhead. He wants to undermine the original being, creator, and his government, and his spiritual laws, and this is what we're seeing. So the abomination of desolation can also be found in 1 Maccabees 1.54, Let's read this again. Now, the 15th day of the month of Kislev, in the 140 and 5th year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and builded idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side. Does we see that? The month of Kislev, ninth month. We're in the month of Kislev, aren't we? We sure are. We are in the month of Kislev. So moving forward now, this is relevant. This is prophecy. You should be excited. Now, the abomination of desolation refers to a statue of the Greek god Zeus that was placed in the temple by Antiochus IV Epiphanes. They had a uh, special program on the History Channel in regards to, uh, hey, <laughs> in regards to, uh, you know, Jesus Christ walking the earth and having his ministry. But actually, it was Yeshua, Yeshua Hamashiach, that usurped Zeus. He became more popular and more powerful than Zeus. He actually dethroned Zeus. Christianity dethroned Zeus once and for all. Isn't that awesome? Just totally knocked him off, the, knocked him off his throne. Yeah, it, it's amazing. You know, it, it's incredible. So let's think about this because, you know, if we love Yeshua, you know, this is the thing I'm learning about Yeshua. He's taking me through the warning stages. He's warning me. He's showing me stuff and warning me. So guess what? I have to warn you. If somebody loves you, they warn you. Okay, they warn you. Now let's look at the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15. Uh, let's read it together. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. 
See, as Christians, as believers, we have to understand the prophecies. See, people are being programmed that they're going to be raptured out of here, and then all of this will happen, and it doesn't even matter because we won't be here. How many of you know that that is a lie? We need to know what's coming. We need to be prepared, amen? Well, I'm not going to go through Irma. I'm good. I could have said that in my home. I knew better. Prepare for the storm. And two trees went down as we were taking refuge here. Just missed the house. It was a wake-up call. Amen? This particular word abomination means a detestation, special idolatry. Now, if Yeshua is going to reference the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is good. He's referencing Daniel. People want to say, oh, the book of Daniel was written after the fact. No, it was not. You just can't get over a God that knows the future. How awesome is our God to tell us what's coming? Right? I mean, think about it. He's got the ability to warn you about something that's coming. I mean, he doesn't have to go so advanced in time. He even says, oh, after a thousand years, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. He didn't even have to sell sell that to us. He didn't have to state it. This is what I'm saying. He's awesome. We need to be talking about them. What's the millennium going to be like? Amen. What's going to be Yeshua's budget? <laughs> Are they going to finally fix the roads and bridges? What's going to happen? You know, have you ever thought about it? When he comes back on the Mount of Olives, what do you think is going to happen? Everything's still going to be one dollar. <laughs> you guys selling these things for one dollar, you stay. No, have you thought about this? It doesn't talk about the earth going through a change. It says he will rule with a rod of iron. <laughs> An iron rod. Oh. You know, you get out of line. Oh. Come on, have you, am I the only one thinking about this? I mean, for a thousand years, he's going to rule and reign. No shenanigans, right? Then after that, Satan is loosed one last time to deceive the nations one more time. The false prophet goes into the lake of fire, right? Right? The Antichrist goes into the lake of fire. No, Satan's bound up because God's going to use him again after a thousand years like a junkyard dog. Because that's all he is, is a junkyard dog. He's got him on a chain. God's in control. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. It's that simple, folks. You're wondering why you're having such a hard time. You haven't submitted to God. And some of you are like, well, I've submitted to God. Well, then you don't know how to resist the devil because he's up to his old little tricks against you. He's crafty. He's been doing this for thousands of years. Some things have been revealed to me this last Friday, this last week, that I'll be sharing with you in the future here because I'm telling you right now, it's life changing. It's a game changer. Game changer. Let's look at Daniel 9, 27, because that's what Yeshua is quoting. Where, where did Yeshua get this? Let's read about the Antichrist in Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Take the scriptures literally. Let me tell you two things that's going to happen. There's going to be another temple built. Period. The Messiah is not going to build it. Somebody's going to build a temple. They're going to build something. And guess what? There's going to be sacrifices again. Boy, that's going to mess up your theology, isn't it? Now, Jesus is our sacrifice once and for all, but we have to take the Scriptures literally. How mature do we need to be? Pretty mature to go through this. Isn't that going to be interesting? That's, that's going to be a great time for all of us. Because all the Christians are going to be, how come I'm still here? Well, get to work. Get to work, buddy. Go work in the nursery. We need you. Right? Got two suitcases looking up. That's goofiness, man. We got so much work to do. I'm telling you, we really, really do. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Why one week? There's only one week left in the prophecy. Okay? There's only one week left in that prophecy of the 70 weeks. We won't get into all that. So this is what I love. This is what's so cool. What would Jesus do, bracelets? Can we pass those out right now? What would Jesus do, bracelets? 
Yeshua predicts that the Hanukkah story will play out again. Right? I'm going to show you, in hindsight, what we already know versus what Yeshua said, and now you figure it out. Amen? I only need two people to be excited. I'm telling you, this is incredible. This is a geographical prophecy, okay? This is geographical. Let's, let's look at the persecuted flee into the mountains. The persecuted flee into the mountains. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 16, here's the Olivet Discourse, amen? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Is that Yeshua? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why? Because you have the abomination of desolation. Because we just read about that in Matthew 24, 15. So you have the abomination of desolation. He says, when this thing goes up, get out of Jerusalem. The persecuted flee into the mountains. Look at this resource in hindsight. 1 Maccabees 2.28. Let's read it together. Thereupon he, Mattathias, fled to the mountains with his sons, leaving behind in the city all their possessions. See why it's important? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. We're learning about the story of Hanukkah, are we not? More details in Maccabees chapter 2, verse 28. So there was a fleeing into the mountains, right, in the past. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It happened in the past. It's going to happen again. Matthew chapter 24, verses 17 and 18. We're going right along the line here. When you flee, don't take your belongings. Let's read it together. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Matthew 24, 17 and 18. Is that specific? It's like, don't waste any time. It's like when a siren goes off in Israel, I think the kids have, what, 30 seconds to get into the bomb shelter. You don't have a minute. You don't have a minute and a half. You have 30 seconds. Does everyone say what I'm saying? She came like, hey, you know, I need my wallet. No, it ain't going to work, folks. Right? I think I left the burner on. No, get out. Get out. Once again, when you flee, don't take your belongings. First Maccabees 2.28. This happened 164 B.C. Let's read it. Thereupon he, Mattathias, fled to the mountains with his sons, leaving behind in the city all their possessions. Amen? We've got to get our house in order. Are you able to walk away from your house? Think about these people that lost their homes in California from a fire. They said, everything we ever had is in that house, gone. They lost all of their possessions. Amen? This is how it is, though. We live in a materialistic society. Amen? He's got to wean you off these possessions. Look at Matthew 24, 20. Let's read this together. Pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath. What does he say? But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Wow, Yeshua is giving you the answer. He's telling you when it's going to happen. Oh, by the way... Pray that your flight is not in the winter and on the Sabbath. He's giving you the answer, right? Because he's a loving God. He's not mysterious. He's not trying to pull one over on you. That's not the way God is. Matter of fact, it's interesting. Yeshua was saying that, hey, listen, you know, I speak to them in parables because I want to find out who has the Torah and who doesn't. So, by the way, don't Christianize the parables. The parables are all about the Torah. He's trying to see who has the Torah in their heart and who doesn't. Because we're still a victim of legalism, which is man's commands. Man's commands can never supersede God's commands. And so Yeshua would challenge that, amen? But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Let me ask you a question. When is Hanukkah celebrated? Winter. And then he mentions the Sabbath. So what does the commentary say? Oh, he's speaking to the Jews because they keep Sabbath. I love that. Not. It's for whoever's keeping Sabbath. Right? These commentaries. Well, Paul was telling the church to do these things because it was for the Jews but not for the Christians. But he wanted the Jews to do that they could do. No, hogwash, man. We do it too. Paul's instructing the church. He was sent to the church. <laughs> and that's what the commentaries do. Don't you get sick of that? Guess what? I called it out. Enough's enough. 
Oh, look, he's going to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. It's the Jews. Look up the word elect. It means believer, Jews and non-Jews. Come on, man. There ain't two bus stops. There's only one bus stop, right? And if you're there, you get the ride. If you're not, you're missing the bus. I'm sorry. That's as far as I'm going to go on that. Now, let's look in hindsight at 1 Maccabees 2.32. Look, look. Let's read it. Many hurried out after them, and having caught up with them, camped opposite and prepared to attack them on the Sabbath. Now they're going to fight them on the Sabbath. They're going to go after them now. They're going to go after them. And look at 1 Maccabees 2.38. We were in 2.32. Let's read it. So the officers and soldiers attacked them on the Sabbath, and they died with their wives, their children, and their cattle to the number of 1,000 persons. Amen? They wouldn't fight on the Sabbath. Well, guess what? They learned quickly that they're going to fight on the Sabbath. Remember the war of Yom Kippur? They chose to fight back, didn't they? They didn't say, no, peace, brother. It's feast day. No, let's <laughs> gird up your loins. Let's throw it down. Let's get this thing going. That's it, man, you know. So there's things that we got to do on the Sabbath, amen? So, so they fought back. I just want to let you in on that little historical account. Uh, in Matthew 24, 19, look what Yeshua says in regard to pray that you do not have a young child of circumcision age. I mean, we have a lot of children here. This is relevant for us. He says, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Those that are pregnant and those that are breastfeeding. Does everybody see that? Woe unto them. See, woe unto them because it's difficult to get out of a city when you're pregnant or when you're breastfeeding or you have a little one. Amen? So he's given a warning, isn't he? Pray that you do not have a young child of circumcision age. First Maccabees chapter 1, verses 60 and 61. Women who had, had their children circumcised were put to death in keeping with the decree with the babies hung from their necks, their families also, and those who had circumcised were killed. Are there atrocities going on today in the Middle East? Are people being beheaded in horrible things? I think I saw a picture, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I don't know if it was photoshopped or not. I don't believe it was. But in, in the middle of one of the streets in Syria, they had this, like, cage with children inside of it, starving them to death. But you sit in your little purple chair, enjoy the show. Right? Have some more iced tea. Watch some more TV. It'll all go away. Oh, it don't affect you. Oh, it's going to affect you. Because spiritual warfare affects everybody. Amen? Oh, a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands. It will come upon you. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. Amen? Look at the future Antichrist will pick up where Antiochus left off. This is so simple, everybody. It's not complicated. Evil is evil. Good is good. Okay? Satan has seed. Okay? Daniel 11, verses 36 through 45. Actually, verse 35 is like a transition verse to go either way. But we're going to look at the son of perdition. So let's look at Daniel eleven thirty-six, the Antichrist. Let's read it. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. It's like this cup of iniquity, amen? It's got to fill up and spill over before the next event. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Look, the king shall do according to his will. This is the Antichrist, the son of perdition. We just left off verse 35 and 34 is Antiochus, 164 B.C. We're, what, 2,000 years later, right? More than 2,000 years later, this is what this guy's going to do. Like father, like son, the fruit, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Let's look at Lucifer's five eye wills in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. Once again, Lucifer, light bearer, five eye wills. Look at this. Number one, this is the father. I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will sit in the temple mount. I will sit in the temple mount. 
Notice Lucifer, Satan, devil, prince of this world, the dragon. He will literally be the father of the Antichrist, Genesis 3.15. There's enmity between the seeds. You must understand this, everyone. God wants to make you distinct. He wants to make a distinction throughout the earth. Who are his children and who are Satan's children? Who are, who's obedient? Who's disobedient? It's very clear if you look at the last week of Yeshua, he just gives nothing but warnings as the dying of a person on the cross. Go back and read it for yourself. Go back and read it for yourself. Matthew 25. There's 10 versions. Five of them are foolish. Five are wise. People get talents. What did you do with it? What you did to the least of them, you did to me. You did all these things in my name. I never knew you. He gives these warnings. We need to wake up. I fear God. I don't know about you, but I fear God. When those two trees went down, it shook me. Not that I didn't need that, but it did. It, it, it rocked my world. It shook me to the core. I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I actually had to go lay down on my bed. And I was shaken. I was so overwhelmed that Monday when those trees went down. I saw that. It shook me to the core because I was, had my whole life flash in front of me. That I could have been ignorant and just, you know, stayed in the home or, or rebellious or whatever, and the tree could have fallen on my family. I could have just made one decision. One bad decision could have cost me my family. Because God wants obedience. He doesn't want disobedience. He told me, get out of the house, go to the church. That's what I do. Yes, Father, we'll come to the church. Amen? Genesis 3.15, you know, the woman has seed and Satan has seed. I don't try to figure all this out. I don't have all the answers, but it says there's enmity between the woman's seed and Satan's seed. So go figure it out. I believe it. Lucifer's five I wills, continuing on. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five, I will be like the most high. Wow. That didn't work out. And you know what? God says, what, two words? Huh. The pit. The five I wills. No, the pit. And he's going to execute judgment when he comes back with his mouth. He's just going to say something. Poof, it's going to happen. It says with the, with, with, with the words of his mouth, he will execute judgment. He'll just speak it. Boom, you're done. Boom, you're done. You're done. Look at Daniel eleven thirty seven in the Antichrist. Look, look at this. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Just like Jesus. He was never married, never had children. This son of perdition is sold out. He's not even going to have a wife or a marriage. No regard for women, no desire for women. He's Satan's seed, amen? He can't regard the God of his fathers because Satan is his father. The Antichrist father is Satan. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. You know, Paul got a lot of revelation. I don't understand what I'm saying. I mean, I'm in love with Paul. I mean, really, there's a bromance going on, me and Paul, man, because Paul is awesome, man. He's been so misrepresented, so twisted his teachings. He's a brilliant, brilliant person, smart. Oh, my gosh, that guy was way ahead of his time. And, you know, if you'll just pray, like Romans 9, 10, 11, if you'll just pray in the Holy Spirit and then read his stuff, you will understand exactly what he was saying. I think it was meant to disrupt, you know, people that had no intention of keeping it. Or not keeping it or, or, or whatever. But look at, look at this. Let's read this together. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. The apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. See, there has to be a falling away. Because that's what we're seeing. They've already proven the church is dying. The millennials don't want to go to church. They don't believe in organized religion. They got their own little fix and their own way of doing spiritual things. It's been proven. It is a fact. The community is dwindling down. But if we say, oh, look, we are returning us and our children. How I many of that's different? 
Because contained within the promise is your children being organized for God. Amen? That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let's read verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read it. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wow, the, the Antichrist is fulfilling the Father's, right? Fulfilling what? The Father's wishes. Because he's the Son. It says right there, he's sitting in the temple. This is why having Jerusalem declared the capital of Israel is a great thing. It's going to lead to the temple. It's going to lead to the Antichrist, which ultimately will what? Lead us to the Messiah's return. I love it. This word will not come back null and void, folks. We are progressively moving towards the fulfillment of scriptures, and we do have a happy ending. We do live happily ever after. I'm sorry. That's what I read. I don't know what book you're reading. Stephen King? I don't know. Change your novels. Perdition means eternal damnation or utter destruction. Does somebody come to mind that was referenced as son of perdition? Judas. Judas Iscariot. If he's the son of perdition, then Genesis 3.15 is, is alive and well. It is true, amen? Daniel 11.38. Daniel 11.38. Let's read it together. Okay, I wasn't ready. I'm sorry. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, munitions, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things or things desired. Amen. Who had precious stones embedded in them? Lucifer. Amen. The light gatherer. See, he was meant to gather things and give the glory to God, and he felt it and said, oh, this is great. Amen? And then he fell. But in this day shall he honor the God of forces or munitions, ballistic missiles over Japan. See? The leader of North Korea, he's going to show you his ballistic missile. He's going to shoot it over your country. Hey, look at my ballistic missile. His munitions just to put fear, just because he can do it. Amen? And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things or things desired. Look at the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, 22. Let's just cut to the chase here. This is the one that we all have to watch out for right here at Beit Tehila. In Matthew 13, 22, let's read it. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he become unfruitful. Amen? The care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. If you can overcome that in this congregation, how many of this, the cares of this world is all over you? Amen? Let's say you're just disgruntled about your email account or your spam. You're just disgruntled. Man, my emails. Or, man, my phone's acting up, you know. I just can't get Wi-Fi. I just can't get it. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. And time just goes by. The cares of this world have choked out the word, folks. Are you kidding me? I just say forget about it. It'll get fixed or whatever. I mean, come on, forget about it. Right? I'm trying to watch regular TV with rabbit ears, HD antenna. It's frustrating. Amen? Trying to watch the evening news with PBS. There's no commercials. I like their accents. And the picture's great. And the verbiage is coming out, but then there's like little breaks in it. You know? Like to report in Eastern Europe at coming down the mountain. I'm like, what is up with this? Come on. I'm like, cares of this world. Oh, man. Got me again. It's like my remote control. I still can't get over it. It's the care of this world. I searched the couch the other day in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. All I found was old socks and goldfish and some hairbrushes.
listen, I love college football, but I guarantee you this, I'm not going to miss this service to watch a game. I'm just going to tell you straight up, that's where you got to find where your heart is. Right? Because where your heart is, that's a treasure. See, to me, being here is a treasure. Amen? I'm not thinking about the food court, right, and the bourbon chicken with macaroni and cheese with the noodles. I'm not thinking about that at all. Right? I'm not. Okay? I just think that the food court there has the best bourbon chicken in the world. But I'm not, I'm not going there till later. All right, let's read 1 Timothy 6.10. Here's one of the Pauline epistles, pastoral letters. Let's look at this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The Bible talks about, I think even Paul mentions sometimes in his letters, he actually says something to the degree of, hey, listen, if God has given you wealth, be careful how you use it because it could be taken away. Some people have the, the gift of giving. They can give. So once again, from Daniel 11.36 to the very end, we're looking at Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, let's look at Daniel 11.39 in regard to the Antichrist. You notice how we're having, like, technical difficulty? Because it's Satan. He hates my guts. It doesn't frustrate me because it doesn't matter. I'm going to preach it anyway. I'm going to teach it. I'm going to speak it. It's coming towards me, whether it's up on the screen or not. You know what really scares me at night when I lay in bed? All the prophecies that are taking place and being fulfilled, and I'm, duh, missed it. You know, prophecies are being fulfilled right now, and you haven't even read them because you're not in your Bible. I'm only sharing you the stuff that I know. What about all the other verses I don't know about? Oh, my God, I'm telling you. See, we need a breakthrough. Once you get the breakthrough, you're like, oh, my gosh, he's talking to me. You talking to me? Yeah, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. Daniel 11.39, Antichrist. Daniel 11.39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds. With a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. As Christians, we need to wake up to the reality of the land is important if it's a prophecy. Wow, if I'm still here, I'm in Florida, 6,000 miles away, and he's going to divide the land for gain. How many of you it doesn't work? Land for peace really doesn't work. Look at Gaza. It's the 4th of the July every day in Israel. They're, they're shooting these rockets, man. Come on. Oh, and by the way, as far as a Palestinian state or a two-state solution, oh, by the way, this is a fact. If they were to do that, not one Jew could live in that area. Did you know that? Oh, they don't want to talk about that. How many Jews are in Gaza? We don't know. They're undercover. We don't know. I'm just saying. How many Jews are in Gaza? Probably zero. How messed up. You see the battle that's going on right now? And the Israeli Supreme Court is demolishing homes and settlements and stuff. And people live there 14 years and they just destroyed it because two feet off or something, landmass or something. Speculations. Once again, you know, we're moving forward. Look at that. Daniel eleven thirty nine. 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. In Joel chapter 3, verse 2, let's read it. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, let me ask all of you a question. Does God care about the Jewish people? Does he care about Israel? Does he care about the land? We should do the same thing. See, this is the revelation that I got. I want to love what God loves. Amen? And if I don't have it, I'm going to muster it up. I'm going to do something. But I want to love what God's love. And I'm going to tell you right now, God loves the Jewish people. He does. He loves Israel. He loves Jerusalem, okay? He loves this. He loves the land. See, this is what I'm saying. 
you're the apple of God's eye, and the enemy's going to poke God in the eye, you think God's going to say, oh, that was a good one. <laughs> no, it's going to be, you're done. You don't mess with the apple of God's eye. That's your pupil. You don't poke God in the eye, folks. He will bless those that bless. He will curse those that curse. We need to bless the Jewish people. Speak positive. Speak, speak highly of them. Bless them. Speak blessings over the Jewish people. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right, two of you. Leviticus 25, 23. Who does the land belong to? The united nothing? No, let's read it. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. The land belongs to Yahweh. I mean, I was trying to find Israel on a map in the homeschool room. My gosh, I had to turn the light on, get a flashlight. Is, is Israel here? I found Egypt, then I moved up. It's just this little sliver. And the map's big. Like the screen in the back. It's like that big, you know, the map of the world in our homeschool room. I'm like, because I, I wanted to see something in, in regard to the east. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's like nothing. Size of Jersey. New Jersey. A lot of you left Jersey. It was too small. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 43. Let's read this. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Has that been done away with? Can we say this has been done away with? No. Man, if I can just get your heart to line up with what I'm telling you from the word, you would rock the world. Your life would be changed. I've always prayed, Lord, let me love the people the way you love the people. That's a powerful prayer. Because, you know, we can't really love very good. Right? We don't, we don't love really good. But if we pray, Lord, let me love the people the way you love the people, he'll start doing something inside of you. He will give you that. Look at the kings of the north or Syria and the south or Egypt versus the Antichrist. Daniel 1140, here we go. Kings of the north, Syria, and the south, Egypt versus the Antichrist. Do you see the stage being set? There's 90 million Egyptians down there. 90 million. Look at Daniel 1140. This is the Antichrist. Look, let's read it. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Some people think the Antichrist is going to take over the whole world. I beg to differ. My opinion, based upon the evidence, he will control the Mediterranean. But if you look at our government, <laughs> what does it matter anyway? Right? Right? I mean, think about it. So Syria is going to play a big part in the days ahead because the Antichrist from Antiochus Epiphanes is going to be a Syrian. Daniel eleven forty one. 41. Let's read this together. He shall enter also into the glorious land, Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon or Jordan. Wow. Have we heard about those three countries before? Remember, Israel had to go around them and not fight them. These will escape out of his hand. It says it right there. Edom, Moab, and the country of Jordan. That's over by the Dead Sea. Amen. Take it literally. Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Daniel eleven forty two. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Wow, they got 90 million people down there. And they're not going to be able to stand up to this. Have you noticed the shakeup in the Middle East with leadership? People that were in leadership for like 40 years, right? Now they're deposed. All of North Africa right now is like tribal clans, civil war, things going on. You ever heard much about, about Libya or North Africa? Very unstable, right? Daniel eleven forty three. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians, North Africa, shall be at his steps. Do you see the instability today where this could actually take place? This instability? 
The stage is being set, everyone. Daniel eleven forty four. 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. We know that China's to the east, but also uh, Iraq is. And who's infiltrating Iraq? But Iran. Something's happening. The power grab is happening right now. You'll see. Israel, America, and Saudi Arabia are allies. Okay, Iran, Russia, Syria are allies with themselves. Daniel 11.45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, the Mediterranean, and the Dead Sea, in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Does everybody see that? It says he's going to sit in the temple. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Don't argue with me. Take it up with Mike or Libby. Don't argue with me. The Antichrist is going to sit in a temple. The Antichrist right here, what's he going to have? A palace between the seas in Jerusalem. I mean, don't try to figure it out, right? I'm still trying to figure out how God's going to restore the whole house of Israel. But let's just, you know, let, let it speak for itself. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Wow. How's he going to do it? He's just going to speak it. Some of you have to change your speech. Or you're not going to make it. What you speak comes towards you. You must understand this. That's why the more social media you're involved in, the more blogs and opinions, the, the downfall's coming. It's just a matter of time for you. You have to speak over your own life. You have to speak the truth, amen? John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Boy, I would love to read all of that. It'll happen one day. Yeshua's deity in Hanukkah. Wow. Here we go. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. This is all going to make sense, amen? Yeshua's deity in Hanukkah. So John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. Let's read it together. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Do you see it? What's the Feast of the Dedication? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. And where is he? Is he hanging out by the Dead Sea? No. Wow, it's Hanukkah, and he's on the Temple Mount, isn't he? Oh, is it winter? How many clues do you need? So this is what he does in John 10, 30. He purposely does this, right? Look, look, let's read it. I and my Father are one. Jesus is God. God is Jesus, folks. I'm sorry if that's a newsflash, but there's no debating that. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. And people wonder why deity is so important. Why is the Godhead so important? I'm going to tell you why. Because God loved us so much, he took on flesh like us, but he was God. So the spiritual laws are, okay, if you marry a woman in the Torah and you divorce her and she goes to be with another man, you cannot have her back. It's an abomination. So how does God get around that? He becomes flesh. To prove his love for you. See, I've debated this. I see bugs and little gnats swirling around yesterday in my house. I respect the little gnats. Where do they come from? Old fruit hanging in your basket. But I'm amazed at stuff like that. Remember one of the plagues? And the Egyptians said, hey, this is the finger of God. We can't make this. I mean, I got tweezers, and I'm trying to do these little wings on the gnats. It's just, it ain't working for me. Someone took my magnifying glass. See, God is a creator. There's no end to the universe, folks. They never found the end of the universe. They never found the end of the universe. How many galaxies and Milky Ways and Snickers bars are there? How many? Have you ever just, I just think about that stuff. But going back to the creation, God is a creator. And we're digging up all this stuff in the earth that's not a homo sapien. I don't know what this is. <laughs> this is f something from Jurassic Park or whatever. But I'm saying to you, but we were made in his image. And even the angels go to the Father and say, why 
Why are you so crazy about those people? Why are you so madly nuts about these humans? I'll never forget, my children wanted mice, and I ended up getting them. If you know what I mean as a parent. So I change it out and stuff. Go down there at night. That's when all the activity happens if you're a night owl, right? That's where all the bedding makes, and they're, just, they're doing stuff. I remember being down there with the, with, the, with the mice and watching them and just in a distance, and they were just doing stuff. I'm like, man, this is incredible. It's like I'm watching these little mice run, and I feel like the Holy Spirit was like, I like watching you. I, I like watching you. I'm like, oh, that ain't good. <laughs> no, nah, really? Are there cameras in the bathroom? <laughs> no, man, come on, Lord. You stay out there, right? But, but the Bible talks about he goes to and fro, searching and seeking after us. See, you're not pursuing God, everyone. He's pursuing you. I'm telling this from my heart. All you have to do is, is, is yield and surrender. Say, Lord, I'm yours. Just surrender. It changes your whole life. What are you going to end up pursuing? I'm 50. I'm having a midlife crisis. I don't want a sports car. I just want my life back. But I'm thinking now that I'm 50, and some of you know what I'm talking about, what's really important in life? What am I going to show for my life? Amen? I and my Father are one. So here's the good news, John 10, 42. And many believed on him there. Is that you? Think about that place, the Temple Mount, Jerusalem. Amen? On October 19th, 1997, Danielle and I started our courtship. That's our anniversary. During the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, I got to confess my love for Danielle. Out of all the places I could have done it, out of all the time frames I could have done it, God saved it for that place in that time to prove a point how special it is. Amen? Think about Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. A few little notes here this morning. I was just thinking about this real quickly here. And I'm just going to share this out of my heart because I, I just think it's relevant. In 931 B.C. in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33, uh, you're going to see that uh, Jeroboam, okay, after Solomon's death and the kingdom's divided, we're talking 931 B.C., Jeroboam decides to do what? Change the capital. See what, oh, come on, somebody. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, this is such a treasure you know, we, we try to get into the Word, and we don't feel like we're a theologian. We didn't go to seminary. We didn't do that. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit will show you everything you need to know. All you do is you look at God's Word, and you see how He took something apart. And you place those parts, and you see those parts. And when you go back into the story, you simply just put them back together the way they were taken apart. So now, all of a sudden, Jerusalem becomes the capital, and now Jeroboam, is gonna, you know, he's going to declare something. Oh, no, it's going to be Bethel and Dan, not Jerusalem anymore. This is in 931 B.C., folks, when Solomon died. Do you see where God's putting the pieces back together now? Oh, I'm telling you, he's really doing it. This is very interesting in Haggai. How many of you are familiar with Haggai? It's a big book. It's got two chapters. Oh, yeah. If you have small children, it might take longer to get through those two, but you will get through it. Right? Haggai. Now, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Is this relevant? See, if you're not in the Word and the Word's not in you, if you're not in your Bible, you're going to miss God, everyone. That's why the Bible Museum went up in Washington, D.C., because a man heard from God. Because we need Bible revival. And they spent $500 million dollars on the Bible Museum. State-of-the-art technology. Some of it's even patented. It's not for anybody who's faint of heart. Look at Haggai, chapter 2, verses 18 and 20. And by the way, this took place in 520 B.C. We went from 931 B.C. to 520. Haggai, chapter 2, verses 18 and 20. Consider now from this day and upward, from the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month, Kislev 24, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid 
Consider it. How many verses prove the Temple Mount is special? What's the history of the Temple Mount? What's the history of, of this time period of Kislev 24? Because 25 is when they celebrate Hanukkah. The 25th of Kislev is, is when you celebrate Hanukkah. That's when the abomination of desolation went up. Three years later, they celebrate Kislev 25 for what? Eight nights. Verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came into Haggai in the four and 20th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Nobody is speaking highly of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. They're all against it. The day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. And even today, there's controversy over the Temple Mount location. People want to have controversy that, oh, the Temple Mount's not the Temple Mount. So because of Giovanni now, I have to look at Zechariah. I mean, it's, a, it's his fault. I want to show you something. Remember, you want to love what God loves. I'm telling you, and I know it's hard. Some of you don't love Israel. You don't love the land of Israel. It, that is, this too will change. But look at this. In Zechariah chapter 2, Zechariah 2.10 is where it starts out, and it goes all the way to 4.7. But look, look at this. Look at this. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. He is choosing Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh. Before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. So the president of the United States of America declares Jerusalem is the capital of Israel just before Hanukkah. I'm telling you, it's not an accident. We need to know this. Shall choose Jerusalem again. Oh my goodness. Finishing up here. I got to finish up. Here we go. Jerusalem's enemies to be destroyed. Jerusalem's enemies to be destroyed. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Let's read it. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, poison, unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Oh, my gosh. How many people are drinking the cup of trembling right now all over the world? The president of France, the Pope, is trying to meddle in God's business. Amen? I'm telling you. Somebody call the fire department. Because I'm on fire. I am. And I love what Jeremiah was saying. He said, I got fire shot out my bones, but I don't even want to do it. I'm tired of the people. People have tired me. But I got fire shot up in my bones. I'm like, I can relate. Right? It's a cup of poison. Look, look at verse 3. Let's read it. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. I'm telling you, I was out by the pool, and Miss Ruth called me. Hey, did you hear about Donald Trump? He, uh, he just declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Yay! I'm like, yeah, I just read it in the news. That's awesome. And, and as I was talking with her, just before that, the Lord took me to those verses in Zechariah. Isn't it funny when you start having conversations with people about this? I don't think you should have conversations with them. Because they're going to show you exactly who they are. 
I don't think it's right. Oh, have some more fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Really, get a bushel. Have some more to eat. It's not right. Really? And who made you God? Not. Why can't we admit that he is God and we are not? He is the creator. We are the creation. We are nothing without him. We are helpless. He gives you breath. Amen? Hanukkah traditions. Happy time. You like how I made that switch? Cup of poison. Hurry, hurry, my tea. Oh, and there's Hanukkah traditions. It's festive. It's fun for us, but not for the heathen. <laughs> Let's look at the Hanukkah once again. The Hanukkah, it's nine branches, right? So they say that the oil lasted for eight days. It was a one-day supply, and it's folklore. It's a tradition. It's a legend. Listen, even if you took the miracle out, you still have a story. It's really about dedication. Hanukkah means dedication, okay? So you have the Hanukkah, and of course, uh, if you're not Jewish, you can light it any way you want. You have the shamash and the four on either side. So whatever you want to do, it depends if, you know, the small children are involved. But uh, make sure your Hanukkah is put out at night before going to bed. Some of you uh, actually have fear, and you have electric ones. And uh, you put the bulbs in yourself because, hey, you don't trust yourself. And I, and I don't trust you either. So there's the Hanukkah. It's not a big deal. How many of that's not going to hurt you? Lighting a Hanukkah is not going to hurt you. Number two, the dreidel. You spin the dreidel. There's four Hebrew letters. Uh, this is where I get to take all of my children's change. And, uh, you know, uh, legend has it that they were, they were of course, uh, wanting to talk about the Torah, but they were forbidden. It was against the law. So they would come together and play these, like, games and have a little dreidel. And so when the Syrian Greco soldiers would come by, like, you know, Sergeant Schultz, you know, I see nothing. <laughs> they weren't playing a little dreidel game. They were talking Torah. Okay. And uh, you'll see that as far as yeshiva goes and stuff like that. So the dreidel, it's not going to hurt anybody. Four different letters. Each one represents what you get and what you don't get. Chocolate gelt. Special coins were minted to celebrate the Maccabean Revolt, amen, and, the, uh, and how they uh, were victorious. And so there's no guilt in guilt, folks. Uh, just make sure you don't put the guilt on the dashboard of your car in the state of Florida. Or you're going to have one big guilt. It's going to be like championship WWF belt, you know, one big piece of chocolate. So um, chocolate guilt. So that's where we get the chocolate guilt. Last but not least... Uh, you eat things fried in oil. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is a man's holiday, folks. We know anything tastes good fried, even a shoe. You would eat it, right? You go to the fair. Is that a deep fried Twinkie? I don't know. I have two. <laughs> Lot keys, I interpret this for you. Potato pancakes. Amen. Some of you are a little outlandish in your toppings. I, I'm traditional. Uh, sour cream and applesauce, okay? Some of you like to do like cheddar cheese and jalapenos, and you're just not right. Wait a minute. Maybe you're Sephardic. Yeah, a little salsa on my, yeah, whatever. So those are the things that are going on. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. If you don't believe it or don't want to practice it, we're not going to excommunicate you until next year. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's what you want to do. It's what you're comfortable with. How many of you say what I'm saying? We're just trying to build memories with our children. We're trying to relate to the Jewish people, and that's what it's really about. Amen? Uh, things are being restored. Things are happening. So Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. Hanukkah is a real word in closing here. So we have to ask ourselves a personal question. What are we dedicated to? What are we dedicated to? You know, uh, on November 17th, 2002, my father-in-law went to be with the Lord, you know, and I reflect on that, you know, and I got a picture of him at the wall, touching the wall on my, on my desk, just to remind me not to quit, to go forward. Amen? Because, man, that man worked hard to get this land and to do the things that he did for all of us. I can only move forward and, and, and hope and pray I can work half as hard as him. So what are we dedicated to? So all of you have a little picture, I hope, that you were given. Uh, this was taken from the orphanage. It's, it's an orphanage that's uh, just across from the Mount of Olives. It's one of the best views of the city. You'll see the Eastern Gate, Kidron Valley in front of that. And you'll see, of course, the Dome of the Rock. But uh, this is where it's all going to go down. Amen. 
Remember, when you cry out to God, say, God, I want to love the things you love. I'm telling you, he will transform your spirit, your mind, your life, the things that you used to want to watch and see and do. You, you won't have nothing. He will put stuff in you that he wants you to do. Amen? The incredible things. So in closing, uh, we're going to uh, have a very special video of 2015 at the time of, uh, of uh, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Uh, we have a little two-minute clip here to show you, uh, and you'll probably recognize uh, some of your brothers in, in the Lord here. Uh, we went down to the wall, and just to give you a little encouragement in the days of Hanukkah, amen? And next week we'll be celebrating Hanukkah on Wednesday night, and then, of course, um, uh, Saturday, and then uh, the following Monday. So three out of eight nights we'll be celebrating. Some of you are having Hanukkah parties. Amen. I might be crashing some of those. We'll see. And uh, that's really about it. And, of course, Monday night is Miketz. And uh, we're going to be sharing some really good stuff about the, uh, uh, the Torah portion and about Joseph and his reunion with his brothers, how relevant it is for today. And so, once again, this is a video that we took uh, with the Osmo camera. It came out really nice. Uh, going to the Western Wall. It's Shavuot, uh, Feast of Weeks, uh, 2015. Мне уже глаза сейчас не забивают. Он выбирает, что-то 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 что